last week we talked about temptation. And the fact is that sometimes we give in to temptation. So this week and next week, and hopefully I can start you know, preparing. I'll never get that done in a week. And uh, so I'll probably make it a two-parter. And I'm just hoping now that I can even get it done in two weeks. Uh, I don't know if anybody here struggles with that. But if you don't, it will equip you to help somebody that does. Amen? And uh, I mean, I've shared in the past, and even recently, about three stages of sanctification. Can anybody tell me what sancti sanctified means? Sanctification. What's the definition? In a few words. Set apart. Very good. You were listening or you knew one. Set apart. I've talked about three stages of sanctification. Can anybody tell me what the three stages of sanctification are? Justification. No, you're talking about five major doctrines. Okay, sanctification. The first stage is initial sanctification. That means to be set apart from the penalty of sin. Amen? When you come to Jesus, you've been set apart from the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. Amen? But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So that's initial sanctification. You're set apart from the penalty of death. The second stage of sanctification is, okay, sometimes we have this kind of a dinner. It's a, we go from one place to another. There you go, progressive. Progressive sanctification. And what that is, is being set apart from the power of sin. In Romans chapter 6, it tells us that when we come to the Lord Jesus, that uh, uh, it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen? Okay. And then the third stage of sanctification is to be set apart from the very presence of sin. And guess when that happens? When we go to heaven. Amen? There will be no sin in heaven. So we'll be actually separated from the very presence of sin. But I'm only going to sit around on the second phase this morning, progressive sanctification. And again, the definition of progressive sanctification is to daily be set apart from the power of sin. And this suggests that it's ongoing. You know, it's not a, uh, uh, just a, you wake up one day and uh, decide you're never going to sin again and that's it. You just never sin again. You know, that just really doesn't happen, does it? I mean, I haven't met that person. And I'm definitely not that person. I mess up, you know. I mean, shoot, I think, well, about eight months ago I messed up. Of course, that reminds me, and some of you heard this before, that my very first church I pastored, you know, I was up there and I was preaching. I was a young man, about 23, 24 years old. It was just a couple years ago. And uh, I, uh, I said, you don't have to sin. I said, I don't remember the last time I sinned. And my wife says, try this morning. And I said, well, I don't need the Holy Ghost. I got a wife. <laughs> so, uh, but we don't just wake up one day. But when we are born again, we're given the power to resist sin. But there is still this thing called the unrenewed mind. Amen. And, uh, uh, you know, even though we've been forgiven, we've been empowered, we've been set free to choose, we still have this unrenewed mind to deal with. And we, again, we talked about uh, uh, temptation last week. And we talked about three areas that we are uh, tempted in. Can anybody tell me those three areas? There's the lust of the flesh, flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Amen. Thank you. So, we've been given resources to overcome. However, the fact remains that we sometimes succumb to temptation. So when we do, when this happens, what do we do? In 1 John 1, 9, it reads, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we do mess up, we are told that He is faithful. Amen. We may not be faithful all the time, but He is always faithful. There's never a day that God is not faithful. We can count on that. Amen? He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. God understands that this transformation doesn't just happen in one fine swoop. You know, we're not just living one way. Now, now, a lot of it happens immediately. I know when I got saved, I was a messed up teenager. You know, I was 18 years old. And I was a, I was a, a teenage drunk. I was a, a, into drugs, and and when I got saved, I got delivered. I mean, man, I, I mean, I was, you know, light day. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, night day. I mean, it was just a. Uh, uh, there was a transformation, but there was still an ongoing transformation taking place. And that happened according to Romans chapter this is my, Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 2. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's how you're transformed. By the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You renew your mind by the Word of God. Amen? That you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are being transformed by the Word of God or by renewing our minds. And during this process, we do sometimes mess up. But when we mess up, God has made provision. In fact, he's, He made it easy. He said, if we will confess, acknowledge to God that we have messed up, in one swoop He does remove that sin from us. Amen? You get a fresh start. The Bible tells us that His mercies are new every morning. Isn't that good news? The problem sometimes that we have is we do not let go of it. We do not let go of the shame uh, that wants to stick to us sometimes for years. You know, there are some people still fretting over what they did 20 years ago. God's forgiven we just need to learn how to forgive ourselves. Amen? We need to learn how to, to, to let it go and, and to move on. God has. I'm extremely thankful that we live in the dispensation of grace. Now, if you don't understand that word dispensation, it means time period. Uh, there's, there's ages or time periods. Let me just run through these very quickly. I'm not teaching on this today, but just throw it out there. I won't charge you any extra. The first is the, the uh, dispensation of innocence. That's back before man fell. Okay. Then there's conscience. That's well. That's after he fell and was conscious of sin. Then there, there was human government that came into play. Then there was the promise given to Abraham. Amen. So we had the dispensation of promise. Then after that, one you hear about a lot is the dispensation of the law. Okay. And then. And now, we're under the dispensation of grace. Grace and truth came through Christ Jesus. So now we're under the dispensation or age of grace. And then there would be the millennial kingdom of Christ that is coming. And uh, thank God again, we live in the day of grace. Thank God for grace. Amen? However, you know, God was quick to forgive even in the Old Testament. Uh, if you look at Psalms 145 and verse 8, it reads there, the Lord is, we just sang it, as a matter of fact. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He's slow to anger and great in mercy. Then you have Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, He separates us from our sin. Never be joined again. The implication is that sin will never come up again. Unlike my wife. <laughs> she's not in here. I'm going to talk quieter so she listens while she's back here doing her thing. But, but my wife. Can you hear me? She can remember things. Now she's not so bad now. But, you know, During the first 20 years or so of our marriage, you know, she, she can remember things. And she knew how to bring them up. You know, God doesn't do that. Amen? God doesn't do that. He says, what sin? I don't remember that. That's been forgiven. That's been forgotten. It's been removed from you. My understanding is north and south at some point meet up. But east and west never meet up. Now, I don't know a lot about that, but I'll just take their word for it. Amen? And that, but God says we've been separated from our sins. It also goes on to say, 
uh, you know, that he's buried in the, in the deepest part of the sea. Now, that's not saying, well, you know, if you go down far enough, you can find him. No, he's just making a point that he's not going to bring them back up again. Amen? And, uh, matter of fact, Corey Tinboom, anybody remember Corey Tinboom? You know, she was uh, uh, in the concentration camps uh, uh, back uh, uh, during the, the World War One, and, and it was two. I mean, it was just a terrible, uh, terrible time for the Jewish people. And uh, but she she said, God cast your sins into the sea, and he puts up a sign that says, No fishing allowed. Amen. Isn't that good? You know, he doesn't want us to go fishing for our for our sins. So he has compassion. Uh, Psalms 103, uh, verse 13. As the Father has compassion on His children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. He has compassion on us because He understands our struggles. Under the New Covenant, we have a friend, and His name is Jesus. Amen? And Jesus was tempted in all ways that He might know what it is that we go through. So he really does understand our struggles. The only difference is he never gave in. Amen. We know he never had a sin nature. He was not born in iniquity. He isn't in the middle of a rebuild. Did you know you're in the middle of a rebuild? You're a rebuilding project. You're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. I wish I had the talent to rebuild a car. You know, I, I'm just not that person. You know, there's a lot of things I look at people or guys and say, man, I wish I was that person. But unfortunately, you know, I look at Miracle, you're not that person. You know, I, mean, I look at Tom and what he can do and you know, working on cars. I, mean, I wish I could do that, but just not, I can change oil. You know, I, I can change some brakes. And that's about as far as my mechanic, mechanical abilities will go. But I think I can preach a little better than Tom. Yeah. I don't know. I never have, he's never wanted to preach for me. But we're a work in progress. We're growing. We're being conformed into His image. There's a song, and I, I like to be able to sing it, but you don't want me to do that. So I'll just say the words to you. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide us till the day is done. There is not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Isn't that awesome? And that's so true. You know, much of the church is at one or two extremes. A growing segment of the church says we're not to give thought to sin. You know, they say that Jesus took care of it. Sin's not an issue anymore. You don't have to, to really think about it. You know, you should not have any remorse. You don't need to repent. And in some cases, even deny the very existence of sin. Now, unless you do a lot of reading or listen to a lot of TV or you may not even know what I'm talking about, but... But there, there, there is that going on. Now the other extreme is that we should constantly focus on our sin and wallow in the guilt and shame that's associated with it. Well, through prayer and study, I, I really feel like, at least for me, that I, I found a biblical balance within all of that. I believe the Bible tells us that we are to acknowledge our sin or to confess our sin, then we're to move away from our sin. Amen. Actually, we don't have to do the moving. God does the moving for us. Like I said earlier, He separates us from our sin as far as the East is from the West. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we'll get weighed down with guilt and shame. And that's not God's intention for any of His children. Amen? How many of you want your children just to live every day in guilt and shame? Now, if they do something terrible, you want them to feel bad about it, don't you? You just don't want them to stay there. And I believe that's the way God feels about His children. You know, he does want us to feel bad if we do something that's wrong, but he doesn't want us to just go on living, feeling shame and guilt. No, he says just repent. And you know what repent means? It means turn around, turn away from it, change directions. If you're going down a, a road that's the wrong direction, God is saying turn around and walk toward me. Amen? You see, that's what we have to remember. In Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 5, I'm going to read this to you out of King James because this is just the way I've, I've known this for so long. But it reads there, and, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto us as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. 
For what what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, we're of all partakers, then ye are bastards, and not sons. Illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of the flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us as after uh, us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now, let me just break that down just for a couple minutes. First of all, the word chastisement is the word padul. And it means to correct, means to discipline. Okay? And a few other things along that line. A lot of folks believe that this means that God, to chasten you, will make you sick. Or God will take something away from you, like your job. You know, well, I lost my job. God must be chastising me. I do not believe that. I believe the chastisement of the Lord is conviction. Let me tell you why I believe that. He said here, if you are without chasing me, you're illegitimate. You're not his sons. Everybody goes through those kind of things, amen? Everybody may lose may lose their job at some point. Everybody may get sick at some point. Bad things will happen to everybody because we live in a sin-stricken uh, uh, world. However, it goes on to say, you had fathers of the flesh and they corrected you according to the flesh. In other words, I know nowadays they send you to a corner. And if that's your way of doing it, that's fine. But that ain't the way they did it in my day. I never went to a corner. I may got thrown into it. No, I don't believe in child abuse, okay? And we've talked about this many times. But I, I remember when I did something, my mama would get a switch. And she'd take that switch and, and it'd wrap around my leg and snap. Now, I don't recommend that. You know, in, our, in rearing our kids, and I think they turned out pretty good, we did spank them. We had rules. Never more than three swats, and you can never do it when you're angry. If mama was angry, daddy spanked him. If daddy was angry, mama spanked him. And I tell you, it hurt the feelings more than it hurt anything. I guarantee it. But we did correct them according to the flesh when they needed it. The thing is, they didn't need it too often because we had a one, two, three count. One, they didn't stop or whatever. You know, the time they got this. Actually, the third time was whenever they got a little swat. So the point is this. Father's correct is according to the flesh. But it says, how much more shall our spirit father correct his spirit children? You can go back and read it again in a minute. So how does a, a, a fleshly father, a human father correct according to the flesh? How does a spiritual father correct us according to the spirit? Conviction. Amen. Matter of fact, in 2 Timothy, can you bring that up, Jacob? In 2 Timothy 2.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, listen, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You see, through the word of God, he will convict us, he will correct us, he will instruct us, he will reprove us. And it goes on to say, at, at the present, it doesn't feel very good. How many know whatever God's telling you, stop that, quit doing that, that's wrong. How many know that doesn't feel so good? When we start feeling kind of bad because we know we've done something wrong, that doesn't feel good. But after we repent of it, after we have a change of direction, we can say, now I've been cleansed of all unrighteousness. Now I feel great. Amen? And that's how it's supposed to work. Now, we, we did a whole series on those verses I just talked about. But again, it's not comfortable when we're convicted of our sin. Should we be sorry when we sin? Yes, I believe we should. I want my children to be sorry when they do something wrong. You know, if my little boy, well, I don't have a little boy now, but uh, you know, well, my boy, of course, you know, is a big boy now. But, but you know, they pulled some girl's hair. I wouldn't feel bad because they pulled their hair, amen? 
But I don't want them, you know, to live the rest of their life feeling bad because they, they did that. Now, what does God want us to do? He wants us to stand up. He wants us to repent and move on. Conviction is not a bad thing. You know, actually, pain is not a bad thing for your body. I mean, I'm not, I'm not fond of it, but it has its purpose, amen? I mean, if you lay your hand on a hot stove and you don't feel pain, you're in trouble, aren't you? Until you start smelling your flesh burning, you're not even going to know that you're in trouble. But, but because of pain, you touch that, oh, ouch. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to take my hand off of that. We well, see conviction is the same way. Conviction tells you that you're heading down a wrong road. And you feel bad because of it. That's conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that way you know, I don't want to go that direction. I want to change directions. I want to repent and go this way. You see, conviction is a good thing. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction says you're messing up. You're doing wrong. Here's what you need to do. Condemnation says you're just a failure. You're just a, a nobody. You're just a, a mess up. <coughs> and they give you no way of escaping. Of course, conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Condemnation comes from the enemy. Amen? Hey, how you doing, sweetie? <laughs> I heard you talking about me earlier. <laughs> Hallelujah. Again, conviction is a way of warning us. We're heading down a dangerous path. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. It reads there, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Sorrow is good, but we don't want to get overcome by sorrow. Amen? You know, we don't want to get overcome by shame. And speaking of shame, shame's not always a bad thing. You know, a little shame can be healthy. Have you ever heard someone say, have you no shame? That's saying, really, you ought to have a little bit of shame. Amen? Sometimes when a person consumes too much alcohol, they, they lose all sense of shame. And some young lady may find themselves looking on YouTube the next day and find themselves dancing on a table naked or something because they had no shame. So a little shame is good when it's applied correctly. Amen? But you don't want to be overcome by it. Don't dwell on it. Don't give up because of it. Repent. Turn around and move on. See, we don't want our sins and our mistakes and our bad decisions to disqualify us from the assignments that God has given us. He doesn't want you to give up just because you messed up. Amen? He wants you to turn around, walk away from it, and move on. Amen. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to the church basically reproving them concerning some of the sins they were committing. Then he turns around and writes a second letter, which is known as 2 Corinthians. And in chapter 7, and verse 8, he refers there to the first letter that he wrote. Everybody follow that? Okay. And it reads there in, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 8, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. See, the proper balance is to be sorry for a little while. Enough to bring change to your life. But not so much that it opens up a door for the enemy to pour in guilt and condemnation and shame. Amen? Amen. And defeat and discouragement. Which he's good at. In 2 Corinthians 7 verse 9, he goes on to say, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. See, we're not to wallow in worldly sorrow, hanging on to it. It tells us worldly sorrow produces death. It eats away and is slowly killing us. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want us to give up. He doesn't want us to give in. He doesn't want us to lose our joy. He doesn't want us to lose our peace. He doesn't want us to lose our vision. He just wants us to give up. 
the sin. Amen. He wants us to repent. He wants us to turn away from the sin and then also to turn away from any kind of guilt and shame at the same time. Because again, His mercies are new when? Every morning. Every morning. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, it reads, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow produces life. It produces cleansing that brings us back to 1 John. Amen. And again, in 1 John, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Godly sorrow is but for a short period. It helps us to gain perspective. Then we're to let it go. Amen? We're to confess, we're to repent, change directions, and let it go. And I believe that's what God's calling us to do. Amen? Amen. Don't hang on to it. Don't let it weigh you down. Just with the help of the Holy Spirit, move on to where God's called you to go. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm going to close right here. We'll pick up on this again next Sunday. I want to invite you would just bow your heads for a moment. Just close your eyes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. I just ask that you would administer your word to our hearts. Let it sink deep within. Let it be Apply to our mind, Lord, as we all are making every effort to remove, renew our minds with your word. And Lord, I thank you that your word says that we are more than conquerors, that we are victorious in you. And Lord, I thank you that you have equipped us to overcome every temptation, every obstacle the enemy would throw at us. But Lord, I also thank you that you realize that there are times of weaknesses. Lord, I just thank you that when we are weak, you are strong. Your provision is plentiful. And Lord, we're careful to give you all the praise. And Lord, if uh, your Holy Spirit is speaking to someone this morning, just pointing out an area that needs to be given over to you, pointing out a, a role they need to make a, a change of direction, and Lord, I pray that you would just minister right now, and that you would uh, bring the victory in Jesus' name. It's as we surrender to your way. Because Lord, we know that Father knows best. And Lord, we just want to follow your will. And we know God that because we do that, we can experience the abundant life that Jesus came that we might have. And we just bind the enemy that would come to steal, kill, and to destroy. And we just believe, Father, that you are good and you are compassionate. And God, we thank you for your love for each and every one of us. Lord, I just thank you that uh, you have great things in store for your people. And I just thank you for every, each and every one reaching our destinies in you. And we're careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 We're going to.